Marilyn Robinson's housekeeping is the story of sisters Ruth and Lucille, who grow up under the competent care of their grandmother and then under the scattered care of their eccentric Aunt Sylvie. They live in the town of Fingerbone, not far from the lake where their grandfather was killed in a spectacular train accident, and their mother drove off a cliff. Now, I realize this description sounds like a big, giant downer of a book, but it's kind of the opposite. Housekeeping is a beautiful meditation on growing up and loss and survival and love and what it means to keep a house, both in the literal and figurative sense. Hello and welcome to The Best Book Ever, the podcast where we get to know interesting people by asking them about their favorite book. I'm your host, Julie Strauss, and today I'm talking to Jessica Bell, an author, singer, songwriter, and book cover designer. I love noticing book covers. I love paying attention to what I like about them and what I dislike about them. And it was really fun to talk about them with a professional. Even better, we talk about the insides of books, and this book in particular, which is kind of hard to describe and really hard to forget. Hi, Jessica. Welcome to the Best Book Ever podcast. Hi, Julie. Thank you so much for having me today. Let's start with the background first. You are a multi-hyphenate artist, which I find thrilling. Will you tell our listeners all of the different things that you do? Well, I am a singer-songwriter, author, poet, graphic designer, publisher, and voiceover artist. I don't know how that I managed <laughs> to do all of that in my life, but I do. <laughs> do you do do you focus on one at a time and kind of move phase to phase, or are you do you kind of always have your fingers in everything? No, my fingers are pretty much in everything. I mean, I will in one given day I will work on a book cover, I will do admin for my publishing company, I will listen to some music that my music partners produced and think of some lyrics that might go with it. I might sit down for 10 minutes and have a coffee and try to write a poem. <laughs> I mean, it's all happening at once. I, I, I don't think I could do it. Any, if I just, if I focus on one thing at a time, I get really bored. <laughs> were you, were you raised to be creative? Where did, where did this wellspring of creativity come from? Well, my parents are musicians and they also are uh, very, very good illustrators, though they both never did anything with it. My father paints and my mother draws. Uh, my mother's a guitarist, so is my father. My mother sings, writes songs. I grew up with music around me every day of my life from the moment I was born. Um, I started writing music myself when I was around 12. Uh, all because my mother had left her 12-string guitar at the front door ready for someone to come and pick up and buy because they had a parking fine they couldn't pay. And I said <laughs> to her, I opened it up and it was just in this beautiful red velvet-lined case and I was just awestruck by this instrument. And I said, why are you selling this? And she didn't really say very much, but she said, okay, I won't sell it if you learn to play it. So from that day, I taught, started teaching myself how to play guitar and I wrote my first song, Plucking One String. I have it recorded somewhere. I have, I have to dig it out one day. But, yeah, that's how it all started. Do you, how do you, you now have a family of your own. How is your, yes. how are you fostering creativity within your own family? Well, I'm always singing to my son and reading books and watching great movies and um, <laughs> it's really funny that it's caught on because he started narrating but singing his movements during the day. I mean, he'll say, <laughs> I am going to build a house. <laughs> <laughs> it's absolutely adorable. So, yeah, we're a very creative family too. My partner is also a photographer and film director as well so in the blood my kids are all older now but um for me the key to creativity was always being unafraid of a mess yeah. and my kids are all very creative kids and i don't have artistic talent other than books and words 
but I like to think it's because they destroyed the house with all of their projects. <laughs> I I feel like if you're afraid of mess, then you're never going to get the paints out. You're never going to let them bang on a musical instrument until they figure it out. That's true. I mean, if you're afraid of mess, facilitate the mess somewhere where it's okay. Like go outside, <laughs> set an area where, where there's paint and dirt and whatever and smash it out there. I mean, yeah. I don't think art can happen if you're inhibited in any way. I mean, I always start a book, or especially nonfiction. When I'm writing nonfiction, I'm always saying to myself, I don't have to publish this. Just be honest. And that's the way you get the best nonfiction, I think. It's by just really giving your, your self permission to say exactly how you feel. Tell our listeners about the book you just released. Uh, it's called Can You Make the Title Bigger? It's called The Chemistry of Book Cover Design. And Big S um, spelled the Australian way. <laughs> <laughs> the slang way, yeah, with A on the end, <laughs> um, which has proven really good for search results <laughs> because it's has not it? used. Uh, I've been working as a book cover designer now for since 2011. So it's really about everything I've learned about what makes a good professional book cover that's going to sell a book. Uh, it talks about uh, colour theory, emotional symbolism, practical advice like trim size and page count and paper colour and binding and all that stuff that an author needs to know, along with uh, artistic ideas and lots of examples of book covers and what makes a book cover striking and uh, makes a reader want to pick it up. Isn't it funny that we use that phrase, never judge a book guy by its cover? is a phrase that's, you know, it's commonly used in everyday life. And the thing that's funny to me about it is it's what we all do all the time. Every reader I know has picked up a book solely for the cover, exactly. including me. It's the first me. thing you see. Yeah. It's, it's, everybody judges a book by its cover. It's impossible Always. not to. And yeah. I have also rejected books that mm -hmm. later found out they were a practically written with me in mind. Yeah. But I hated the cover so much that, oh, that one's not for me. Yeah. And it bums me out a little bit that I that I am so susceptible to the visual aesthetic. Well, it's advertising, it's marketing, it's all part of how to hook your reader in that very first instant. I mean, if they don't, if your book cover doesn't entice you, you're not going to read the book description, are you? Unless it's recommended by a friend. Right. I think word of mouth is the only thing that's going to overcome the power of the book cover. What is your professional opinion of this copy of Housekeeping that I have? This is an American copy of it. And uh -huh. listener, it's a, well, it's very drab colors. And yeah. it's a sort of rickety house and the whole land in front right. of it is flooded. Yeah. Yeah, I'm not a fan of it. Why? No. Because I have a copy that I like more. <laughs> mine, mine is the illustrated version. Uh, I can't remember which year it is. Somewhere in, in the late eighties or nineties, it's illustrated watercolor with white and pastel blues and greens and sort of peachy tones. So it's uh, it's old fashioned looking cover, but the colors are very warm and inviting. I think that cover looks a bit depressing. It is, and the story is depressing, but it's also not at the same time equally. I think <laughs> it's very inspiring as well. But you can't you can't choose all the elements of, that are inside the book to represent on the cover. Like you need to choose which audience you want to target and and guide the look of the cover towards that. And I wonder, because as I was reading it this time around, knowing I was going to talk to a book cover designer about it, I was really thinking about this cover. And the thing is, this copy, it has my maiden name on the inside, which means I bought mm -hmm. it probably when it was released. I've been married 28 years, so it's I've had this for a long time. Yeah. And I feel like it. Pr I probably thought it was a little bit quirky at the time. I'm sure it appealed to me at the time. But yeah. you're, I look at it now and I just think it's a time, it's a time sensibility thing. Whereas I look at it now and I think, God, these colors are a bummer. It's a yeah. weird sort of dirty, greenish, yellow tone. But I love the idea. I love the way the house is reflected in it. 
Yeah. There, there is something about it that's quirky and appealing, but it's very not modern. That, that, that cover actually reminds me of my favourite quote in the book, which I have written down somewhere for you. This is it. It was, a, it was the kind of loneliness that made clocks seem slow and loud and made voices sound like voices across water. I love that line. I had it written on a mug. <laughs> Did you really? Yeah, yeah. Actually, sorry, my Vine Leaves press partner, Amy McCracken, had it painted on a mug for me and sent it to me for my birthday. I didn't do that, but I told her it was my favourite quote. It's one of the most thoughtful presents I've ever had. Really. <laughs> that is extraordinary. I never thought of that before. What a thoughtful gift, because yeah. I've had so many people tell me their favourite quotes from books. I'm immediately thinking my best friends, I know exactly what they're getting for Christmas now. Exactly. Because I know <laughs> that's the thing I know about my friends is their favorite book quotes. What a great idea. Yeah. And you're right that this picture really exhibits that perfectly. It's because yeah, it's it sort of echoey and haunting and very lonely. There are no people in this cover. Yeah. I mean, it's, it is. It's really beautiful. I mean, you can hear just by that line. I mean, you can hear the loud and slow clock ticking and mm -hmm. echoing across that flat lake I mean you think it's echoing and ticking and trying to reach the disappearing voices of loved ones that you wished existed you know I think yeah. it's just beautiful my friends if you're doing your holiday shopping and you don't already have a favorite local bookstore check out bookshop.org you can search their store locator page to find an indie bookstore near you, and every purchase you make on the site financially supports that store. Or, if you're so inclined, you can use my link, and a portion of your purchase will help support this podcast at no extra expense to you. Go to bookshop.org slash shop slash best book ever podcast to learn more. And while you're there, get your own self something real nice, because shopping is exhausting and you deserve a new book. Thank you for supporting this podcast and our beloved independent bookstores. Now, back to the show. Do you remember how you found this book? I was at school. I had to study it in high school. I think I was the only student ever to like this book. I mean, everyone thought it was boring. I mean, when you're 15, it's not a, really a book that would appeal to a 15-year-old, but it did to me for some reason. I think maybe because of my musical background and my my newfound love of writing at that time too. So, how does your musical background affect what you read? I really, really enjoy the sound of words. So I'm very aware when something doesn't flow properly. The best thing about a book is when you're reading and you don't realize you're reading. I mean, I think that's. Uh, one of the my favorite aspects of reading I just think the cadence of the words and I think that really affects the way I write as well so and poetry too sure do you have that thing where when you're reading you actually hear it hear the words yeah I just you do hear my, yeah in your voice hmm. yeah you I, I don't everyone hears it, isn't it? I don't think I do. I see that going around on social media a lot where people talk about if they hear the words or not. And I don't, it's, it's very, it's always very visual to me. I see a movie really? playing in my head, but I don't necessarily hear someone reading the words to me. I think it depends on how it's written. If it's in first person, I think it's more likely that I hear the words, but if it's in third person, I'm reading a story that's already been told so it might be different I'm not sure I'll have to take note of it next time I read yeah it's funny though I can't get into audiobooks like I feel like it goes through one ear and out the other I need to read it to comprehend a story it's really strange like it becomes like it becomes background noise it's like people talking over a loudspeaker in a supermarket or something like I just can't it's, it's sort of there but I'm not understanding what's happening if there's no melody, it's just monotonous voice talking to me. And because I live in Greece too, and my I'm not 
100% fluent in grief. Sometimes I don't understand everything someone's saying and I've sort of learned to ignore what I don't understand and pull out the the gist of what someone's saying so that I can respond to them appropriately. So it's, there's a mixture of hypersensitivity to what's being saying <laughs> and the complete opposite. So I think that it's a little bit like that with audio books too. How interesting. Yeah. Just uploaded for distribution my first audio book, my own, of my latest novel. Like I haven't done audio books for anything else. Um, so we'll see how that goes. I've narrated it myself, yeah. Did you enjoy that? Um, yeah, it was really good. I, I found quite a few errors actually. <laughs> and it's really funny too, uh, the difference between reading a book and listening to it uh there are certain aspects of the way a book is written that do not translate well into audio. Like you can see from the line breaks on a page who is speaking without having the speech tag like Acacia said at the mm. end. You mm. don't need it because sometimes you have um, a body language going on as well. But when you read it aloud, those transitions aren't as apparent. You have to really... if. In those situations, you really have to distinguish between the voices. Do you do voices when you are uh, recording audio? In my typical voiceover work, I do because I do a lot of kids' books. So I do differentiate with cartoony sounds or whatever. But for a novel, I really had to try and change the intonation and tone rather than my voice so that mm. the character of the dialogue was coming out rather than the sound of a voice if you know what I mean yes I know exactly what you mean yeah it was challenging I would <laughs> think so and m my favorite audio narrators do it seamlessly but it's one of my personal pet peeves that thing that you're talking about about changing the intonation that's an incredible skill. So let's hope I did it successfully. We'll see. <laughs> when you're writing a book, are you thinking about the cover as you're writing it? Um, not straight away. It's usually somewhere towards the end of the book that I start thinking of cover because I like I like to draw on themes and symbolisms a lot more than facts from a book. So but I need to have finished a book before I really understand the book myself. Usually I, I have a plan and a, and a chapter summaries, but never, ever, ever have I kept the same ending than what I planned. It ends <laughs> up being a completely different book. So I'm, I'm never really sure entirely what the book is about until about two-thirds of the way through. And, and then I go it. back and I, I go back and I make edits and mould it all together. And then at that part you start thinking about this is the cover that will appeal to the reader. Yeah. yeah. I want for this. How fascinating. Yeah. Um, okay, let's talk about this book, Housekeeping, which you read in high school. That kind of boggles my mind. I've read it a few times more since, but you I have. think it's been about 10 years now since I've read the book. Will you tell our listeners what it's about? Well, it really is a exploration of loneliness and family relationships, I think. Just the, the dynamics between family members and the way uh, individual perceptions of each other are completely different and you really don't know the truth about somebody unless you're in their shoes. I think it's a very complex story. I don't think there really is much of a plot to this book except the overall feeling you get from it which is very, very deep and profound. I'm trying to think back to what made me want to read it over and over. It really was, in the beginning, the way it was written. Um, and I think I always aspired to write like that. I just wanted to be able to touch people's hearts and souls with a sentence and not an entire book, which I think this book can do. What kind of reader were you at 15 that this appealed to you? Because as I was reading it in preparation to talk to you, I kept thinking the word elegant. And there's mm -hmm. no way 
I understood this in the same way the first time I read it as this time. There's, it's just, yeah. it's very much a book that is, I can see really changing every time you pick it up at different phases in yeah. your life. So yeah. what, when you were in high school and it was assigned to you, what, what were you reading on your own, on your own time? I really liked covered character driven stories. I really liked the gathering. Um, I can remember, um, I loved Great Expectations too by Dickens at that age. It's, wow. I was really attracted to internal struggles and I think it's because I was going through quite a lot of internal struggles at that age too. I mean, my mother was very sick and I was having issues uh, with identity, identity crisis and trying to rebel and be different and I didn't really no I sort of I wanted everybody's attention but I also wanted everyone to piss off <laughs> <laughs> yep <laughs> yeah so I think I really got into the books that dug deep into a, a person's inner being rather than what they are doing on the surface it's funny because when I read this I had been on a streak of strictly genre fiction for quite a while and this one felt to me like um, a very restful escape. Mm. You know, I sort of melted into this one. And it's funny because a lot happens, but it... A lot happens and nothing happens at and the nothing same happens. time. Like you can't, you can't actually explain what happens in the book. That's why I sort of got a bit blocked when you asked me to tell, them, tell you, my listeners what the book's about. Because I don't, there's, there's no, there's no way you can... For example, create an elevator pitch for this book. Right. And I, that's why I was curious to hear what you would say, because if you just reduce it down to these two girls are left without parents and their sort of kooky aunt comes to take care of them, that is a terrible description of this yeah. book. And you yeah. would expect something completely different if you describe it that way when... I think I would, if I were to hand this to someone, I think I would just say, you're just going to settle into this family story. Yeah. And well, it's, this is something I wrote down in, in my, the margins of the book, which I've written down to say to you. Uh, read this to feel your heart beat in your ears, the emptiness in your chest and the melancholia you can't seem to place. <laughs> Oh my gosh! Did you write that on a specific passage, or that was your uh, for the whole? No, book? that was my. That was the whole book. After the whole book. Beautiful. Do you have other passages that you have underlined that you like? Your favorite one that you quoted for us earlier? I did write. Have you ever wanted to savor a meal because you've never tasted anything so good? Well, that's how I felt when I read Housekeeping. To me, a good book is a meal with intricate scents, flavors, and textures that are unrecognizable until I spend a little more time with them. I love to focus on smaller, more self-contained elements when I read because I hate having that feeling of needing to finish it. Yeah. Wait, tell me what that means. You hate having the feeling of needing to finish, meaning as an uh, obligation? No, well... Yeah, if you're reading a book and it's very plot focused, you want to know what happens next. You want to get to the end to find out. There isn't any of that in this book. You don't want to find out what happens. You just want to experience what's happening on that page. So in general, you don't like, say, thrillers or something? Oh, no, I love them. It just, uh, it's different tastes. One day I'll feel like a burger and one another day I'll feel like eating pate, you know. <laughs> yes, <laughs> just yeah. depends on your mood. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, as I said, my sensation was sinking into this. And I that's part of the other reason I like this cover so much with all the water taking over so much of the visual space is mm -hmm. it's weird and murky and water does not belong in this spot on a on a house. And yet you do just want to rest into it and listen to these words and listen to these mm -hmm. people. And what's also funny is the, the slightly kooky aunt that we're, which is a terrible way to describe her. And listeners, 
there's so much more to her than the fact that she's kooky. So yeah, it's funny reading this, how deeply I loved her and how much I rooted for her mm-hmm. when, when you stop and put it into real life terms and you think if an aunt moved in with two parentless children next door to me and the house started to become derelict and she wasn't feeding them and the kids weren't going to school and they were hoarding. Yeah. You'd be the on pe- the of social services. <laughs> oh my God. And you hate those women in this yeah. book because these young girls, they're just, uh, you just want them to be loved and you just yeah. want Sylvie to be loved and they love each other so well and so imperfectly. And obviously I kept thinking these are all, these are the right people for each other. But in that book, I would be one of those fussy old ladies showing up at the door going, have you actually fed these children? Yeah. yeah. (laughs) (laughs) But in the book, I just, just please let them go on their adventures with Sylvie out into the woods. Just let them do it. That's what these girls need. Yeah. But there's something about her language that drew me outside of myself into wanting this life for Sylvie and for the girls Mm -hmm. Even though I, it, it, even though in reality it is absolutely not anything I would understand. It's romanticized, isn't it? I mean, the way it's written, you really romanticize the situation that is uh, destructive. But it feels very healthy in the confines of the book. It does, doesn't it? <laughs> She's brilliant. I love her. <laughs> Have you read other Marilyn Robinson? Yes, I've read Home. I've read Lily uh gilead and what did you think of them nothing beats house case housekeeping okay um what are you reading right now i'm reading giving birth to motherhood it's a non-fiction journal type book which uh helps you uh come to terms with a birth trauma and write your birth story my birth didn't go the way I wanted it to, and I think that's a story of many, many mothers. Oh, that's such a shame. Um, oh. I'm so sorry. Oh, that's okay. I'm going to write about it. This book is helping me write about it. <laughs> mm. All right. Why don't you share with our listeners where they can find you in all of the all of the artistic all of me. <laughs> well, you can find my portfolio website at iamjessicabell.com. There you can access my designer website, my author website, my publisher website. Um, is there something else? Music. I'm sure. Music. Oh, how could I forget? <laughs> <laughs> my music. Yes. So go to iamjessicabell.com. You can also sign up to my newsletter. I send a monthly digest about everything I've been up to. And the book is... Listeners is wonderful. Um, Even if you are not a writer or not interested in book design, I highly recommend reading it simply because of the fact that it is fun to learn as a consumer of books why you like what you like, which is what I did as I read your book. So many times I would turn the page and see a picture of something you were describing and think, oh, of course this is the right design for that book. And without fail, I would think that's the one I would pick up. Absolutely. And it's really fun to get that sort of insight into your own psychology as a reader. So Mm. highly recommend Jessica's book, even if you are not shopping for a book cover designer. Um, I want to thank you for joining me today. And it's really been fun talking to you. And I hope you'll come back anytime you have a book you want to tell me about. Well, thanks very much. It's been really nice speaking to you, Julie. I would love to hear if you've read Housekeeping or seen the movie adaptation and what you thought of it. Also, what book quote would you like to have on your coffee mug? I would love to hear. Let me know your thoughts over on Instagram at Best Book Ever Podcast. Links to everything we discussed are in the show notes or at my website, bestbookeverpodcast.com. If you enjoyed today's episode, please share it with your favorite book-loving friend and rate it on your favorite podcast app. Thank you for joining me today, and I will see you at the library.